And then we're going to, and then we'll do some demos, and then we'll kind of go through and feel free to ask questions as we go through. So, so first, we'll talk about kind of what problem splints is solving. Um, so first, so is trying to solve the other you know, question of um, the Linux and Linux or Unix access control. Um, traditionally, you have your discretion access control, you know, how you're traditionally our owner group other, we are execute. Um, you can, you know, the users can change these. That's going to be finding you from, you know, Shimada 777 on something. That's going will stop you. Manager access control, this is what SLX is. This is set by the system administrator and users can't overwrite it. From Wikipedia, generally, it is trying to constrain a subject from an action on a target. So, for example, like SLX would be like, can't have the data, read the home data. I'll try to answer that question. What is SLX? SLX is security enhanced Linux. It's a, uh, in the family of security, of Linux security modules. Armor is another one. It operates is similar, but operates very differently. SC Linux is all about tags and roles and users. App Armor acts a lot more on actual paths. Um, this is a little bit different philosophy. App Armor is traditionally more on things like clinical. SC Linux is traditionally on RHEL and its clones and upstream all that stuff that inherited from that family. And it answers the same question, you know, may subject do action on object. What kinds of control? Uh, pretty much anything. Users, files, and directory ports, sockets, memory, processes. So like, for example, if you have some process that's trying to JIT memory, it can stop you from executing memory. Turn around to a bug with uh, uh, Rabbit MQ, where it was trying to do some JIT things. And uh, SLX was saying, no. Is it that? Quite off. <laughs> Yeah, something important notes. I think like is evaluated after the traditional access control. So first, check your traditional Unix permissions, then I think is evaluated. Another part that makes the bug is a little troublesome. It looks exactly like a, a, a DAP denial. From a from a syscall perspective, you just get you know permission denied. It looks no different. Something that might be nice to say no. No, I think like no, it just denied. Same, same, the like same practice as well. Talk about itself from running SLX. Well, the easiest way is just run SE status. It will tell you if it's running, we'll say the policy, tell you its current mode, tell you the policy that it will be if you reboot the mode from config file. Or simply, if you just want to see if it's enforcing a permissive, just get enforce. No, it'll, get, it'll tell you enforcing, it won't tell you the policy, but it'll just tell you what state it's in. How you can turn it on? Um, most places, at least in most red hats, it's in SC, SC Linux config, SC Linux enforcing. If you're on an existing system, I wish you just not putting enforcing mode the first time because when we reboot, we might reboot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just putting permissive. That way it just logs all the errors, then you can then debug them and then figure out what you need to change. Uh, Google Docs is being fun, but also check your bootloader. Um, you can also disable it there. Fun fact, if you set SC Linux to disable on the command line, um, it doesn't like to start. Usually, rebooting is the best way is to remove that, that kernel and then um, to start it. We'll turn on the session, set and force one. That will turn it to enforcing mode immediately. You also can just do set and force enforcing or set for permissive or off. And off also works. So, talk about the mode enforcing, that means it's a Full enforcing mode, it evaluates all the syscalls and it will deny. Permissive, it's really support debugging. It will log everything. All the debugging tools are there. And disabled actually turns it off and puts out the kernel. So there's a few policies that come with it. There's targeted, most level security, and minimum. I have, haven't ever found a lot of great docs on minimum, but targeted is what the default is. Um, all the options of policy are defined, everything else is unconfined. So, for example, if you log into a normal Rolox, you are unconfined. So, basically, you can do pretty much anything. Um, something that I recommend is over HTTPD, that's really probably our primary example. Multi level security is um, more advanced 
definitely from like government ones, and you can get really complicated like secret can only secret, you know, top secret can read down, but can only write to itself and stuff like that. So you can do some very complex <coughs> things with multiple of security. So kind of how does it do it? So primarily is labels. Everything is labeled. Processes, files, all have labels. So the files are labeled and actually on this file system because it actually just contain the labels. Everything else is public. And then how are these used? There's enforcement of those labels. So labels contain three parts, user, role, and type, occasional level. But that's we'll cover that here. And for this type, we're only going to talk about type. Um, that's user and role are very complicated and not used for most things. When you see an output, um, you see unconfined U, unconfined R, unconfined T. By convention, users are used for U, roles are for R, type are for T. Um, Preference on the label. Um, pass dash Z to anything. ID, LS, netstat, you name it. It probably accepts cat dash capital Z. And I'll tell you that. Next, I'm going like, we'll give an example of Nginx. So there's the binary for Nginx. Oh, cool. And it is labeled like HTTPD. And these labels are shared with HTTPD. That's why they're labeled like that. But, but Apache HTTPD shares the same labels. The config file, there's even a separate type of the config file. That's it. The HTML files have their own content. There's actually a few different types depending on if it's like in the user's home folder, in the HTML, or in the system part. Even the unit files have their own labels. And the ports. You can kind of see that the ports are often. Awesome. <laughs> what was that one? That one was, oh, that was the, that was the process. You can see the process, the process of labels and the ports. So basically, with the enforcement, the type enforcement, it's like, should Nginx be able to interact with HTTPD content type or like, and there's a loud case, should HTTP be able to access the shadow? Like you can like an example I can show later is that you can put a file with the shadow type in the in the, the data and it will deny access to that file because it thinks it's the shadow type. So even if like you set your home folder to by default, home folders are user home type. And by default, you can't read it. Even if you set your home folder to wide open, it will not let you. So doing this one's errors. So before the application laws will be helpful, and if you're a developer, this is call will be helpful. But if you look at journal CTL, this will get you all the errors, or if you just follow journal CTL when you do your action, you'll see some wonderful outputs. And I'll uh, show you that and you know what it looks like. And it will give you very nice steps. You'll be like, we think it's this. And it's like, it's an ordered list of what it thinks in order of what would be the correct action. All right, now we'll play this a little bit. All right, so this is a CentOS uh, Stream 9 box. And we are enforcing, but we get enforce. We are enforcing. USA status. We're in the normal targeted policy. And I have pre-done some uh, terrible things in this box. <laughs> <laughs> so we do the general CTL. This all this is actually coming from um, C99. <laughs> C99 was trying to go read all sorts of fun things, and it was telling it no. Yeah, there's the AU search, the other guy mentioned. Yeah. The yeah, AU search. So AU search is the thing I haven't talked about. So if you have a custom application that's have a policy, you can run it. Use AU search, type to audit, audit to allow, and then it will just. Run it. The reason why it's called audit to allow it's actually using the the actual error puts the audit file, the audit log, and so it'll and that's what it's using to actually get it. And then the SD module will load that custom policy. 
All right, so let's look at, we can go play of C99, but we're in SELX. Anyone have any suggestions what I should try to do and see if we get told no? Agree the shadow file. Well, first of all, let's, let's, let's be terrible. Let's uh, first set it, let's first set the shadow file to a uh, wide open. That's good to me. Good, let you. Remember, they're root, they're uncontained. Oh, so roots are contained. Roots okay. uncontained. By default, all users are uncontained. So if you LSLAHI, you'll be able to see that Etsy Shadow is actually. Yeah, you can. Up. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I can like I can get it to Shadow Audio. But be, but anything that is contained, so you know, you know we check, you know, these apps. It's got a type, so it's contained. So even if we go. I don't know, I'm not a big user of it, but uh, I'm going to use the task for it. Okay. There's your ECF. Yeah. Oh, I just about found it. Doesn't even, doesn't, even, doesn't even show up. Oh, shadowy. <laughs> fun. Yeah, so another fun, fun thing we can do is, um, I think it's where default also limits port to the execution run. So if we were to say, I want to be a DNS server today, we'll verify that, you know, the index file, the reason why I'm not starting is because the big file is okay. I get told no. I'm going to go check the uh, SA Linux. And there it goes. It's telling you that I'm trying to find a port 53 and I should be able to. And then if you look at the Nginx journal logs, it'll just be like, we don't know. Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah, because you just go there, just. I just fail. It's 13, 13 person to 9. Nice. Okay. Now we can do, we can use on SE Manage. Or to add. Let's throw up here. I mean, tell the type we want the port to be. So we'll do HTTP port T. And we'll tell the protocol is TCP and the port number. Oh, it's already defined. Oh, we'll do some number that isn't defined. We'll do leaked as our port for that one. Because it, it does the exact same thing for that. Or should we convert that? I'll delete it. Could you undefined port 53? That's a good question. Let's try it. Nope, defined by the policy in the system. Interesting. Okay. Cool. So every there is a there's a package and then um I'll put it in my notes at the end. I'll link my notes up at the end. Um, but here's a package that's called SLX policy. Um, and it's got all the policy defined for each level of the system. Your makes sense. Well, we can change this to delete. Prove that I haven't messed up the config file. Check the logs. Wait, so it's easy permission to die still. Oh, that's a quick trick. And we'll just add leaks. I didn't know the whole exclamation mark dollar sign trick. Yeah, that's the last. It's the, it's the last, last parameters. That's cool. Yep. 
Uh, so you were deleting it. I'm deleting it. I need to add. Yep. Now we can start. Internet. Internet. I'll be happy. We'll draw a local hook and actually we'll. I don't trust the DNS holder. <laughs> But now I'm going to put it back to normal work because it'll make life a little bit easier for us later on. Uh, 80, 80 is the normal report, not extra. I don't know what the work. All right, next we're going to do we're going to do our own custom bug route. So by default, we put you know. I'm going to do ls dash d. Now, long. Uh, you do not have permission to read the directory. I mean, I am root. Uh, my mistake. Well, should not be. Why? Okay, that's better. So is root exempt from SD Linux? No, nope. root can definitely, if you're depending on your SLM's policy, you can make root not root. Okay. <laughs> Which is really funny if you're running uh, like Podman, because if you're running a non-privileged Podman inside of uh, the, the container, even though you're root inside the container, if you mount in files, it still will enforce the old- The, 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 the contents. Yeah. Yes. yes. Which can be both good and infuriating at the yeah. same time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For yourself, we're doing dumb things, but also it could be infuriating. So we need also infuriating yeah. even if vendors putting automated uh, containers on your equipment and you can't figure out why their stuff doesn't work. And they can't figure out why it doesn't work because they've never tested it on system running at Linux. Actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do PWD, you'll see where you're at, right? Yeah, because you're looking for that. Ah, uh, you're in the Debian style one. Yes, I'm the Debian style one, yeah. <laughs> what we do, we'll make a new one. Serve dub dub dub. Gotcha. You know, are we, are we, are we going to have a context assignment? Definitely. Okay, we'll restore con. So restore con, what it'll do is it will show the context that has defined for whatever you pass it. Something important to note is that um, you can use ch, ch cron to change the context. However, this is not persistent. You have to do a file relabel. That's which weird. Which that, what that means is that you touch a uh, dot auto relabel on the root of the boot drive, you reboot, and then about, you know, the traditional setting is about how long it takes to do a disk check. It will go through, <laughs> yeah, all the files, and then send them to the Context that's defined in the boss. So, like, so you can use HCon temporarily, but that's not the correct way to do it. And it's not even with the reboot, it's after the reboot with the next disk check? With the next ne next um, auto relay. Interesting. Okay. So, the, man the, the, SE man the SE manage is the magic command we use. And then we can just do. Man, that'd make for a cool CTF style. Okay. Oh, yeah, you can definitely. You could do some very entertaining things that were let you use chcon, but then alias it to whatever you told chcon and then reboot. So you only have like a little bit of time. Right. Oh, fancy. Well, okay, so it's, and then like when you did that, you, you'd go touch the auto relabel in the root drive. And then, you, then when you reboot, you'd have to wait a few minutes for it to uh, auto relabel the top. Yeah, another one of those where no one else can do it. Then you've got no one doing your shit. Yeah. I mean, if you type the dumb tricks with uh, SE Linux. Yeah. Okay, so we'll do F con after file context, add, type, and then it should be, let's do something that will move to public content. There's lots and lots of types. Um, and then you just pass in. Something. So we'll just do bar or w of them. 
Now we'll just do the same command. We'll now restore con. And I can see boom. That automatically does all that for me. And then you know, you perhaps, you know, the dash R is recursive, all that stuff, you know, works as it should. Another thing is SE Bullions. Um, so, for example, if you are not going to try it, um, if you're trying to install WordPress, by default, HTTPD can't talk to networks. Let me go back to C99. Uh, I can get a, get a shell. But if you're trying to, you're trying to bind to a port. So first of all, I can't write because another thing I have set up is um, I just want to check the log. So by default, um, HD can't write to itself. No reason. If it's a reasonable, like it's normal, like static website or like a kind of reasonable default. So those might be traditional ones. Um, oh, boom! So there's there's our deny that we got for the uh, for the port. So, for example, we want HTTP to connect. We can set a rule right there. HTTP can never connect. Or if we want to go label, like we did before, we can go label that port with HTTPD, and then it can go bind to it. Oh, and that's why we couldn't do port 53 because DNS port is already right. The D, it's already defined as a D, it's defined by the schedule so as DNS port type. So bind, so bind has the you know, and there's the and the DS one's all the system has the you know, bind can you know, go to that port or maybe or whatever right, DNS right, server. Right. All the all the servers have the SD one calls for them. Most work. But running Pi-hole with SQLX is quite entertaining. <laughs> it, is, it is possible, but uh, it always winds and moans. And I'm like, this is not small thing, but it should not be that part. It's like, you need to connect to 53 at 80 and like write just log on it. It's like, that's a, the relatively simple SQLX policy. But we can enable this. So you'll also get the same error if you try to connect, for example, if you have WordPress and trying to connect a WordPress up, but do the exact same thing too. To say, hey, I can't pass the database because it blocks the those. Are other crazy things you want to try? Which I'd probably argue in the, the case of enabling WordPress, you'd want to enable it to, you, you'd want to plow, um, allow the specific port, not just. Right. And you can do some more, yeah. Some, like tweaking to that. There's some other tools you can do to make it so it's not as a. Uh, the, the simple solution is to just do that. Yes. Yeah. And also, like, there's definitely been stories I've heard from people who go, like, SMX has stopped things before. Go part of it's like we've done before. If you, you completely compromise, you know, run as Apache, you know, like, you do not have to run on the system. Mm -hmm. Like, you are combined. And, like, I had a friend who had an Android phone. Because I was going to, like, see was as running as a root, but I couldn't get real root because I think SMX stopped it. I. Thinking of the ways you could abuse us the other way too. Oh yeah, you, you, you could make a sys admin life if you intentionally set it up very intentionally. You could. Make... Oh, we're going to talk about this for for a CDC scenario where the application has to run as root, and the only way is to write it. Is that the only way to connect? Or if you're facing web pages in an app and you just remove port eighty from the available context. Yeah. What I've done for web um, server security a lot in the past is just basically uh, each individual like thing I'm hosting is in its own uh, Docker or uh, rootless Docker or rootless Podman uh, container, mm -hmm. and then that way, so you, sure you owned uh, website A, but you couldn't get to website B to mess it up yeah, because yeah. that's its own. Yeah. So you, you, that's not a good one, but you also do it with the users. So you can say, yeah. like, they're all this user. You know, the user can only interact with the things you define it. Yep. I think that's, or since it's a, a bit too probably Apple, but that's something I might need to add to my 
SSH collector box. Yeah, and, and, and the way it works is App on will fall on pass. Okay. So, like, because now you can just see it's crawling on anything. Like, if I do, but I'm guessing one of those, uh, what do you call it? Like the, the Arch Rosetta or whatever. Like, I could ask, like, hey, SE Linux, this command, how do you do it in App on like Someone on some website. Yeah, someone's on the Here's how to do this. Well, man, that would be useful too if you haven't used it. Uh, it the SE Linux subset in there is very handy for finding and getting solutions to SE Linux issues. Yes, like if it has a really nice, if you don't like the GUI and want a nice, like, pretty interface to this output. Oh, you can just install SE Linux on Ubuntu. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, that, that's an easy effect from that yeah. app on. Yes, you can just install SE Linux on, on Ubuntu. Um, I don't know how much testing. They do with it. I do find it interesting if I remember right. SE Linux uh, originally uh, came from uh, the NSA. Yes, it came from the NSA. And fun fact, I think they just issued some pull requests in the past year to remove it because the NSA has been very absent from doing pull requests. It's mostly Red Hat and what all, people. What also is funny is I now work with a guy who worked in the military with. Uh, yeah, and he said that the NSA is basically when they set up a system, you disable it first, set the system up, and then turn it on. And I'm like, really? Because that seems counterintuitive to make sure the box is clean from the get-go. I mean, kind of what you could do is like set it in permissive mode, and then audit to allow it. Yeah. Because like, an example I saw is like if you have like if you have some like this, like a squirrel mail that's like custom app that doesn't have a policy, you can. Put it in mode, install it, run the app through spaces, audit to allow it, turn it back on, and then the big if, like you said, if anything else dodgy happened while you're testing it, now you're going to be locked. Yeah. And that's where you have to audit the, the actual policy that you're putting in place right. to make sure that it's sane. Mm -hmm. So when you say there's a pull request to remove something, I'm, I'm so just going to pull request to remove the NSA specific language from. I say Linux, because it's for the past many years, it's basically been a Red Hat project or the current project. Oh, so like there's a snippet buried deep within that's like, hey, hey this is created by NSA. Right. But like NSA hasn't touched it in like 10 years. Gotcha. So the pull request is like, no, we don't need to say that. Right. <laughs> okay. Like it has it's turned up the NSA. And that's what I, I thought there was like a code commit they made that was going to be pulled out. No, no, no. What was that? No. And like, and that's the reason why MLS exists, I assume. It's like when you look at this line, it's very much like this smells like <laughs> secret. secret. Um, my example, the, the, the thing that we always get is, you know, the. That's the amazing. Mm -hmm. But like, I have, for anyone use it, I think mean, a lot of times it's just using the targeted mode. I mean, but you can get it even like more enforced, like, if you said it correctly, like if you put your sysadmins in the sysadmin role, you can say you can log in to the. To the console, but can't log in to SSH. And that's not SSH. That's SSH Linux telling you. Which will also totally mess with your head. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, you can tell us a tab. I said, why did I get um, SSH access? There's also some fun goals where you as guest users. You can deny those users execute permissions on anywhere they can write. Just there. So you could, I guess one of the things I'm thinking is so, because if you're worried about rogue sysadmins, you could just make their authorized keys file not accept any more keys. Well, the problem is they can also keys have to their own. Right. Well, the problem is that if they can't be able to control state Linux, but you, but you, but you, have to, you could probably type them that. You could, you could type ethical Linux policy out of them with turning off state Linux. Yeah. Yeah. Like give them, give them almost root. Right. But not quite. The funny thing is, you don't have to put in a grub bootloader path. They do not know because they have console access. Because if you go and grab root letter, hit C, that's oh, yeah. equal zero. Then on boot, it's disabled. And like I said before, it won't like. Can you make an SE Linux policy so that you could edit that file? Remember, this isn't editing a file. You're in the grub. You're in grub, setting the Linux command line. Oh, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking of like a remote system. 
Oh yeah, lots of be good. Like they wouldn't have the VM console, but they yeah. have those. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. definitely can yeah. do that there. We wouldn't need to do a, a grub task for that in that case. But I'm following. Right, right. You're you're waiting for it to go. You hit key, edit the menu, hit F10, and you're done. Right. Yes. Okay. okay. Which is further proof the if you have physical access to the machine. Yeah. Yeah. You have the keys. Yeah. Yeah. Like, pretty much, unless you do like grub password and like FDE all that stuff, then maybe you might be. Don't forget to encrypt your uh, your desk while you're at it. And yeah, yeah. yeah. You shouldn't need to yeah. encrypt the desk. Yeah, encrypt the desk. Yep. And also, you might need to encrypt boot partition while you're at it. Yep. <clears throat> I have a project lined up for that. Yeah, I've not. Yeah, because if you don't have the boot partition, then you can just like part the live ISO, go edit. You can just go edit out. I don't need a grub password anymore. Yeah. Well, that doesn't work if you've done. FDE on the rest of it, though. Sure, you can tell the boot partition it doesn't need one, but then when it goes to boot, it can't find the file. Is there a way you can sign? Because the, the boot problem. partition effectively has to be unencrypted. It does, but I think you can sign Grub, and then if the signatures don't match, it won't boot. Oh, yes, yeah, your boot style. Yes. Yeah. yeah you, you have to sign all of your, your Grub config files to make sure that the Grub config files have them in Yes. Yeah, but if you're doing disk encryption for the whole file system, just not it, your boot partition. Yeah. Then it doesn't really matter at that point. Right, because then you have to have a key in order to actually get Yeah, because then you need the password, unless you've done TPM only encryption. TPM only. If you've done a passphrase encryption, then no, you're there. Or like for network. There, there, there are some network attestation. Um, TAM, yeah. I think, is a project that does it where you boot up and it go, goes talks to the key escrow server and it gets a key to go Decrypt a stride. Yeah. Now the attack vector with not encrypting your boot partition, but doing FDE, would be that an attacker that had physical access once could change your boot config files so that after you're booted, it phones home with your FDE password. Like you could conceivably do that, right? Because the bootloader has to load the decrypt the OS drive stuff. So if you replace that kernel and bootloader with a modified version. That phones home after accepting a password to decrypt. Now your machine is effectively backdoored. So you can backdoor a machine, but it yeah, the barrier gets the spot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The barrier gets kind of high at that point. And then what good is it if now you need physical access again, but you lose it in the yeah. So you'd effectively need physical access at two different times with the user booting it up in the meantime in order for that attack to be yeah. really useful. I just remembered, uh, I'm reminded of the XKCD rubber hose. <laughs> yes, I remember very much. And like, yeah, like, I mean, there's all sorts of like, that's not a very flexible tool. I just got the service of like, you can go and the real big things are like, FE, like, know how to use SD manage to add and nice stuff. And also, also, that's not SD goal is all you need. And also, just knowing where to look in the logs, because part of the problem is like, you're trying to get this path thing to work and look in the log and just so you know. SA trouble SLX troubleshooter is pretty helpful. However, if you're in some of the industries, you know, government, sometimes they don't want you running it on production boxes. But if you, you know, if you are doing this, definitely run it in dev. And like walk and like actually watch it. Like a lot of stuff like when we do something or else, like we run it. And like in like when we're on our test, we make sure that we don't trigger any any errors for all of our you know, any standard workload. <laughs> so I was an idiot, and we decided we we have been deploying a edge platform that has vendor podman on it, and they're used to running as root on an open system. They have not tested any other scenario, and I'm I'm sitting here going, I know IT security. If they had eyeballs on this, is going to say no. So I'm going to just build this for everything that they're going to want, so I don't have to change it later. Left ST Linux fully enabled, made them run it as rootless. They were just switching from Docker to Podman too, so they didn't even have all of their stuff in order. And oh boy, was that fight! But uh, we got it running in the end. That's what I mean. Like running as root is like it's kind of scary, especially when you're running somebody else and, and they have access. Like they have access to run things in the system to make changes to their, oh, their containers. Right. That, that, that is a situation where, like, like the problem generation running, like, that's where you want it. Of, like, oh, you can't go access the, the system shadow file. 
or whatever. Yeah, they have to come to me for everything they want, but it's like, okay, that's fine. That's the point. Right, but there's been like too many stories of like MSPs getting hacked off, and then yeah, and somebody gets into their system, and then they get into our system, and yeah, and this is sitting in an area of the network that has enough. Uh, Dangerous materials that we don't <laughs> want other people in it. So right, and, and like that's one of those things. Like I think that's one of those things that's a little annoying. But if you spend enough time, you know, go look at the air. It's usually easy enough to go and yeah, get it tuned. Where my case was, I had a uh, dev folder for my blog using Jackal. So I, I had a bunch of uh, files. I wanted to uh, just quick spin up. Podman with that folder mounted was in my home directory, of course, and uh, wanted to run uh, Jekyll to generate the, the HTML so that I could upload it to the web server. And of course, first blow, of course, I used rootless because why wouldn't you? Right, that's the point of using Podman. And then it just blew up in my face because it was like, yeah, none of these files are writable. Well, I'm running as root inside the container. Oh, oh crap. Okay, mm -hmm. because I'm not really. Like the difference between a red light camera versus bears or pop. <laughs> like one of these says, please don't. The other like, no, no, you're not, you're not getting through here. Right. So I think uh, my my short term solution was just setting it as uh, uh, the, the podman container to be privileged so that it, it could have access to right. it. Right. Then it just went right through, which of course is the the equivalent of putting pseudo on the front of it and saying, <laughs> this time I mean it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, okay, that'll do it for this time. Yeah, yes, I can say, yes, I have my foot, like this system does uh, run it too. Like, that's like on the desktop, that's when it's been getting better. Um, In the past, I started using for around version 23, it was a little bit rougher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the other is like, NVIDIA is trying to GDB merge, but NVIDIA is trying to merge, like when it crashes, trying to do merge GDB, and you're like, you know what? I said, if you keep denying that, I am perfectly happy to be doing that. Hmm. Uh, yes, but what's he going to stop you from RMRF slash? Depending, actually, the, the, depending on the, uh, what use you are, maybe. Okay. It won't let you delete the shadow file. Right. <laughs> the <laughs> web browser. Yeah, <laughs> you try to run RMRF from the C99 show, you're not getting very far. Go. Because, like, thing is, like, even though, like, even though they're, like, even though they're, like open, like, 644 files, like. So, yeah, because if you don't have a, if you're not doing web dev, right, if you don't have a web app, if you just have static system, it shouldn't need anything other than read. Shouldn't need execute, shouldn't need write, shouldn't need delete. Right, it's like. Like and that's kind of you know, security in depth. Like when you're if you're yeah. like that, you should be you know, first setting back controls for and next be that limited. Then second of all, then you should like and then like if someone did, you know, then if you're like, okay, well, turn off okay, well, well that's how yeah. those permissions. Okay, whatever. And I saw that like there and the next like is like you know what DAC is like you can change as a user, you can open up your home folder to anyone. Yeah. But you know, SA Linux, even if you open it wide open. And you're thinking, no, that way, that's stopping you. I actually was trying to find a way. I don't think, by default, there's no way to prevent you from doing that. It was actually one of the, one of the controls for the role line, one of the stigs in general, was preventing you from doing that. I wasn't, wasn't able to figure out a way to do that easily. With, with being that contained, it's not easy to do that. Yeah, because I know people who, on the HPC, who have said, their home directory to uh, read all. Yeah, they're definitely ways to yeah. why? Well, because how else are you going to share your, your hunk of code that you want to Bob to work on with you? Or you make his home directory right <laughs> by you. <laughs> it's like, well, I've run this workload and I want my sketchy script from, you know, the, the, the user that runs all the things right to my home folder. So I have the data just right there. Yeah. Or your uh, uh, includes include something in your home folder so that you when you compile it. Uh, not, not that I've ever done this, but I did see a hunk of code that I, I had to fix to, because the, the user was not the one that was building it anymore, and that user didn't even exist on the machine. 
the, the, this is the confidences, and the the one at the end is always the uh, the ought to allow you to the all catch all. In your statement, reminded me of the whole thing where people listen to a word doc with a hyperlink, and the hyperlink goes to their you see backslash users. Yeah. <laughs> Which, if you happen to be on the same machine and it was running SE Linux, then that would stop you. But if you're running Word with Windows and SE Linux, I don't know. You've got other issues. Yeah. Well, well, can you run it in uh, WSL? I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Mm. WSL is one of those things where, like, because, like, I ran into Word issues because system D is, like, half baked in certain ways. Applications start freaking out because certain things. Don't exist, but do exist. Now I really want to try. System D is more there than it's been in the past, though, because uh, I think the latest version of uh, WSL they they are actually shipping at least a lobotomized version. Of it's lobotomized, but what's his name? Leonard Pottering moved over yeah. to Microsoft. They found yeah. the Red Hat. Go on and call the Red Hat issues. He's now got the Microsoft problems, which is bigger. Yeah. I don't know if you, I don't know, people who haven't read some of the absolutely just glorious things he's written on the system D issues. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, if you start, you're the one for like, to be, you know, POSIX says username starting with a with number is valid. But Pottering said no. So if you had a, a user called zero day, it, I think it turned to the zero, it saw the zero as an ID, locked off the rest of it and just ran it as roots. Oh, nice. boy. <laughs> Oh boy! Yep, yeah, like what they like, like they said, please fix this. Because you know, like I, you know, I want you know to run, you know, my system unit as zero day. So I'm not just run the zero. Well, consider that your zero day. Yes, but it's in Linux. Yeah. You know, you know, put it. You, you can can find that service. These aren't the droids you're looking for. Yes. And then there's, like, like, there's all sorts of the all sorts of rules that you can do. It really bothers me how far off center that is. I don't know what. Oh, right. Because the reason why it's because the time, the timestamp. The timestamp in machine. Yep, time in machine. And in the process, that tells you. There also is a GUI for it as well. Um, I don't know if I have installed this. Uh, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah, so, and the nice part is like, so like on a system like this, you'll get, you know, pop up, you, you'll get notifications, you know, yeah. you get all notifications that, hey, something did something. Oh, uh, okay. And it looks like it was designed by the NSA themselves. Okay, no, there's definitely, there's a whole bunch of tooling. So, like he said, um, the cockpit's got really good stuff. Yeah. There's a few other, um, there's a few other um, GUIs that are kind of nice little. Let you see them. And there's a few of them that, like, it'll again, everything's all done by the same like plugin system. And then there's a button you click on, like, I want to do this. And it will just one step, one click, and it will just do it for you. It'll probably do a bulk it authorization, but that's another fun system. Cool. Thank you uh, very much. I feel like I actually might be able to. Uh, back off my uh, uh, ham handed, just turn off SE Linux. Uh, it, was it, so. it was how to stop saving SE Linux. And I, I gave you information of how to stop disabling it. Then say, uh, hey, this looks familiar. <laughs> I like it. Yep, I stole your idea. Nice. And if you've seen the same course, actually, I, I used to use this theme a lot. Oh, the PowerPoint. The debris, the debris. Gotcha. I just put, I just tweaked the color. I actually don't think I have. Yeah, that, that, uh, that slide did you do the most recognizable. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I don't think I, that must be one of the things that got lost in the wiki. Apparently. However, it is, it is, it is, it is up again. Okay. I, I have to admit, I, I haven't used Google Docs nearly as much as I probably should, but being corporate, uh, he, everything is PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh, so you're using a cloud player. Okay. Yeah, cloud player is 
The reason why I'm using cloud storage is because the domain renewal are cheap. <laughs> but your redirect is that uh, cloud storage static. That's not a redirect. That is a, uh, that's oh, like, it's a page. <laughs> oh, oh, that's fun. I love it. Also, it is written like the 90s. I wrote there's no CSS for it. That is amazing. Also, that's how I just, that's how I write web pages. I write web pages like it's the 90s. A little bit of modern CSS. Normally, what I do is I, I I'm, I'm nice and I will do the. Um... You have a duct tape declaration. That's good enough. Yeah. Well, I would do CSS. Well, I will turn your preferences dark mode, and I will set it dark mode for you. And if you want light mode, I will have to leave light. That, that that is actually kind of nice. I mean, I I admit I've done some uh, single page redirect uh, where it's uh, just a PHP. Uh, and it's just firing off the header to do a redirect. As long as you uh, make sure that when you're sitting in dark mode, you keep the text black. <laughs> <laughs> I got the dark mode, but... Oh, um, it stopped here since we've uh, wandered into the beyond. Yes, the, the after. Yeah. 